The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. At Big Iron Auctions, customer satisfaction is our number one goal. As the 40-year leader in auctions for agriculture, real estate, livestock, construction, and transportation, we are here to serve you. Big Iron will handle everything from start to finish. From meeting with you, to prepping your equipment, writing the listings, and collecting buyer's payments, let us do the heavy lifting for you. We love our customers, and we treat them like family. There's a Big Iron sales rep in your area, so let's get together. To learn more, visit BigIron.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for Hello and welcome to Moving On Podcast. Mark is with Sean Hackett. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida, and he's nice enough to talk about what's going on in the world of commodities. Sean, how you doing, bud? I'm doing super good. Had a good trip up to uh, New York, a great conference. Uh, I'm back and um, I'll be uh, shortly heading to Nashville to see uh, you at your summit conference. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, that's uh, this next week. So we are cool. Week I'm after up, next, but, week after uh, yeah. next, yeah, but it's coming up fast, so I'm looking forward to that a lot. Yep, so it'll be it'll be a good time. I always look forward to having you down there. Um, so we've seen some heightened demand. We've seen everything kind of just rally this week and turn back around. From you know, we we saw this uh, run up 
probably three weeks ago, four weeks ago now. And then, you know, we saw it kind of finally, finally fall off last week. I think we hit the bottom. Of, we talked about that on here about, you know, 401, 405, something like that. We saw that bottom. And then I think yesterday it closed about 421, if I remember right, something like that. So um, we've had a good run up this week. I guess, Sean, as you look at what's going on right now in, in the corn and soybean market, with all the news that we see coming out of our harvest here, how fast it's coming out and and how good the crops have been, we're starting to see some some uh, flipping of the script here, I guess. So your thoughts on what we see happening right now? My sense is that the crops are good, but not not as good as everyone thought on both sides. I mean, it's fantastic crops, but not quite as good. Um, and But, of course, it's been super fast. I mean, it might, it's almost record-setting fast, which means there's just that much more available now than there would be otherwise. So, I mean, if you really think what the market's been doing here, Casey, we get down too low, and what do we see? Big demand. Yep. We get, and we start to rally, and farmers sell. And then we come back down, big demand. And then we rally, and then farmers – that's kind of where we're at, right? Yeah. We're, we, we're going to keep going back and forth. There's plenty of demand for – for U.S. grain because of the shortages internationally, um, but there's plenty domestically for sale because a we have good crops and b we've had an extremely fast uh, harvest and so you know we need to keep eating away at that um, farmer selling overhang um, and, um, and and eventually we will event at some point the the lock and key uh, will be utilized for the storage bins. And and then that overhang of supply will be abated, and that's what the post, you know, post harvest rally is really all about. I, you know, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're getting, I think, pretty close. The fact that we've had such a a fast harvest means that this is a truncated cycle, meaning, you know, we're going to get this is going to be resolved real quick here because it's, sometimes when you get these long, dragged out harvests, you know, you keep this is bam bam here it is what you got to do and it's done. So I kind of think you know by mid November we're going to be done with. How much does the farmer got to sell still and not? And then, then, and then they're going to shut the bins. And I think that's where I think prices can move more protracted to the upside, especially if I'm correct about soybean Brazilian weather in the north and in the, in the central west, Mato Grosso area gets back to a drier pattern. Mid-November onward, to me, looks like a place where we could actually kind of break this impasse in grains and maybe move to some new highs here. Yep. So one of the things I've, I hear everyone talk about uh, as we're getting uh, interviewed for various news outlets uh, during harvest is that, you know, we had one way, one rain delay this year, or we haven't had a single delay, or, you know, the delay we did have was, was significantly shorter than we thought it was going to be. And so the weather, from a harvest perspective, has been absolutely amazing, right? But also means that there's not been any moisture pumped into an already um, very drought-ridden, um, you know, the drop map here, and I'll show you here in just a second what it looks like. But I guess, Sean, as you're looking through um, the scenarios that you see coming right now, looking at winter wheat, uh, how it's been playing, and we're going into the dormancy time uh, time frame as we head into that first of the year uh, winter uh, section of time. As you look at what's going on, Sean, your thoughts there as we head into um, – 2025 as far as moisture goes and what your models are talking well, about. Well, what's been ideal for harvest and actually, you know, maximum bearish fundamental from fast harvest um, is also setting a stage for very, as you said, very dry soils. Um, you know, we've, we've not had ideal weather to get U.S. winter wheat uh, crop planted. Um, and um, there is some models that are showing some rains potentially coming in um late october early november on the idea that there might be actually a hurricane <laughs> hitting central florida again um that could push some moisture into the uh, into the uh, uh into the plains i think that's a long shot forecast it's still a ways away and i'm not sure that the gfs model which is showing this is going to be correct about that um but absent that potential there really isn't a lot of rainfall uh, that's expected before we go into dormancy and when you go into dormancy with very dry soils, with very poor establishment, your susceptibility to cold weather, especially if you lack snowfall, is even greater than it normally would be, Casey. It's, a, it's especially the case when you come out of dormancy in March and April. Like last year, you know, we saw those frost in, in Russia, uh, Ukraine that uh, you know, happened post-dormancy. 
um, and uh, and really hurt the crop significantly. Both Russia, Ukraine, and the U.S. are in a much more vulnerable position for any kind of a uh, unforeseen or or or, or un, unopportunistic uh, frost this coming uh, winter and spring, and um, and so 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 both crops have a huge check mark against them that they did not have last year. Uh, the other factor is if you look at every major drought that the U.S. has had over the last 150 years, Casey, every single one of those droughts began in the fall of the prior year before you know of the, the of the of the of the following growing season doesn't mean every dry fall means a historic drought the following year it just means every drought that we've had that's been meaningful we've had a dry fall so the fact that we've gone from 26 percent of the country in drought to i think 78 percent of the country in drought which was the chart you showed is unprecedentedly quick dry down um in the u.s and that's the kind of thing that suggest to me that what's going on in the atmosphere is highly unusual, highly anomalous, and the kind of thing you typically see during a Gleisberg-type cycle weather event, which is something we've been talking about, that the risks for that um, are really high over the next one to two years, uh, you know, based upon the 89-year uh, Gleisberg, one in 100-year drought cycle. And, um, and so that would be Seeing what we just saw is a checkbox that means you need net, the probabilities have gone up a notch had we've had a wet fall, uh, which would really have diminished considerably the potential for that kind of a drought in the following year. So, so doesn't mean it has to happen, but it's definitely a, a prerequisite for the following year major drought, and obviously could cause some serious serious problems for um, for winter wheat, even if we don't get a frost. Just dry weather post dormancy, when you already have dry soils and the and the crops poorly established, would be devastating. So, so um, you know, wheat's a, a market to watch in the longer term for sure, Casey. Yep. So I, I went out and you know, the one I showed was the typical U.S. Um, drought map you see on every publication that's that's out there. But I wanted to bring up the the world map like you're talking about, and if you look at where um, where Brazil sets in this, um, it is a that the the red that's there um last time we showed this the red was kind of you know kind of through here and then um you know southern brazil had, had gotten some rain so you're starting to see that reflection here but <clears throat> the the red has spread across the uh from east to west now and, and it's it's uh it's yeah dark red, i, I, I so. think everybody has to understand there's, there's two different weather patterns that take place in brazil the southern portion and uh the Central East portion um, tend to be impacted a lot of times by ocean flow, you know, moisture coming off of the Atlantic. So, for example, even though you're showing a lot of red in the very eastern part there of the center east, they are looking to get some pretty good rains here over the next few weeks, like where they grow coffee, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, because they're getting an onshore flow. When you look at the north, the central west, um, that's driven by the Amazon monsoon. You don't get an ocean flow in, the, in that region. It's driven by the activity of the Amazon monsoon, which is driven by the interaction between the Amazon uh, atmospheric river mechanism um, and feeding that Amazon monsoon to create the rains in the northern part of Brazil. And as you know, Casey, and we'll be talking about this when I see you here um, in November, um, is that an extended period of deforestation of the Amazon where 20% of the Amazon is now gone, um, has begun to rupture this atmospheric river mechanism. And we've seen precipitation in the northern part of Brazil and the central west part of Brazil fall by 50% in the last 12 years. In fact, the moisture in the past 12 months is the lowest we've ever seen in the, since we've been having accurate records of this maybe 50, 60 years ago. Um, and it's still falling, we, meaning we, don't, we have yet to... We have yet. There's no confidence yet that we've reached the bottom of this um, of this situation. Um, so, um, without the act an activation of the Amazon, yes, you can get some minor rainfall up there just because you know it's a big place and things can happen. It doesn't mean no rainfall, but I don't think you know when we get it as we get into November and December that we're going to get rainfall. That's going to, what you really need, you need above normal rainfall in this region to turn this around. Um, planting's already behind, and even the crop that's, even though, the, even, and even the progress they are making, they're still doing it in, in less than ideal conditions. Um, 
I just don't think that the soybean crop. See, the one thing that has saved the soybean crop year after year after year is that they increase acres on average by 4% every year. They keep adding acres and adding acres. Very hard to have a negative crop year when you're adding 4% more acres every year, even if yields are off. I don't think we're going to see much growth in acres this year. I think planted acres are, are going to be largely flat. And that means that any uh, yield degradation, you know, let's say we had a, you know, uh, 10 or 15% reduction in yields, which I think would be reasonable to expect from this. That's how much you're going to reduce the crop by. Last year, we had uh, yields down by about 10%, but they planted 4% more acres. So our actual production was down 3 to 5%. This year, we could see something far more sinister to the downside. And remember, uh, Brazil loves to plant soybeans. They are soybean cultural. Th their culture in, in Brazil is soybeans first, the hell with corn. Uh, the United States is exactly the opposite. We love to plant corn, the hell with soybeans. So they are going to do whatever they can to get the soybeans in. Even if it's super, super late, we are going to get at least enough acres into equal last year. But they're not going to plant a lot of those corn acres late in the second crop corn when they start planting it in February, Casey. They're going to back off. And that means that we are likely going to have another very poor year for corn production. Last year, it was down 15% in Brazil. Exports from Brazil are down 36% year over year. Um, and I think we could be down another 15 to 20%. Uh, I mean, that, that production could be similar to last year, if not worse than last year, meaning being down 15 20% from what it was during the year before. And that means two poor crop years in a row. Um, it sets up a really, really interesting a growing season for the U.S. If this dry weather pattern in the fall translates into a uh, you know a dry summer next year, you know, we could be looking at a really, really um, interestingly uh, uncomfortably tight grain market situation, especially for corn and wheat, um, especially. So, yep. yep. And then to illustrate what you've talked about um, with Russia and Ukraine, um, you know, this is a key wheat growing area of, of Russia, and then you got basically three quarters of Ukraine. That's uh, obviously the situation with the war there is hindering a lot of things anyway. But if you look at where they're at here, as far as, as uh, their drop map goes, it looks a lot like Brazil. I always say with, with Russia production, always follow what Russia does. Don't follow what Russia says. Um, clearly, they've had the worst planting season for winter wheat. The only year that might, you know, I don't, it wasn't this bad, but it was, let's say in the, in the scope was 2010, 11, when they had their, that year, I think their crop production was down, I think it was down 30% or 25% year over year. Um, this has been just super bad. They, they've had a few scant rains here in the last few weeks, but nothing that's really going to change at all. It's getting too late to really make much progress. Terrible stands. Um, once again, we talked about, uh, this is much worse than, than the U.S. is seeing, by the way. Uh, just very poor situation in Russia, Ukraine. And a week ago, Russia announced that they're increasing their export taxes by 14% to be effective, fully effective this today. Um, and, you know, so they already know that they're in trouble and they already know that they need to pull back on exports to keep themselves with enough supply for themselves and to keep the market and to keep domestic food inflation down. Um, and so I think, and, and they, it may not be the last time that they raise export taxes. They may do it again. Uh, bottom line is, we're going to see a lot less supply coming out of Russia, Ukraine, um, over, you know, as we move into the end of the year and into 2025. That's something we have not seen them take the pedal off uh, selling wheat for quite some time, Casey. It's a they are the dominant force in wheat pricing. They are who sets the wheat price, and uh, what happens in Russia doesn't stay in Russia. So I really think that even though there's been a lot of selling in the cash market ahead of these uh, of this export price tax increase, because everyone's trying to get ahead of this and not have to pay it, uh, that's now done. And I think we're going to be looking at, an, at, a, at a market that should catch a bid here um, as we move forward into the end of the year, as they continue to pull back on um, and exports. And, and this crop situation looks um, last year. They were down 15% year over year. We are, there's a very good chance this particular crop 
that will be harvested next summer could be considerably worse than this one. It wouldn't surprise me if we're additional 10 or 15% below this past year's crop. If you run those numbers, that means we could be down 30% from where we were two years ago. You're talking about supply loss that is, uh, is it, there's no way to replace that. And if the U.S., which had a great crop this past season, which has been bailing out, uh, bailing everyone out with some big, big exports that we've been getting, if we don't have a good crop, once again, the corn you know, wheat situation looks really uh, uncomfortable to me, uh, you know, going in, especially to the spring and the summer when we really make the final determination of how bad is bad. The market can dilute itself during the winter that, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, boy, uh, we haven't seen a setup like this in quite a long time. And uh, I certainly think that long term physical buyers of wheat and corn really need to be sharpening their pencils about what their needs are, what their realistic uh, economics are, and make sure these current prices, which are incredibly undervalued in my opinion, make sure they, they don't let this economic opportunity uh, pass them by, you know, however they want to do that. But cash buyers of wheat and, and rice, I mean, wheat and um, and corn need to uh, need to be taking some action here, in my opinion. Right on. Okay, let's talk a little bit about where, I don't know, whatever we are. Um like 10 days out, roughly 10 days out of of the election and uh, a lot of stuff riding on the line here. So you've got multiple factors, obviously you got president and, and all that stuff there, but you also have um, House and Senate seats that are up for re-election, those kind of things. That's That, you know, shapes the scope of what's going to happen as far as policy-wise as much as anything else does. So I guess, Sean, as you're looking at this, your thoughts on the election as we head into that. I always look at things from the economic side because that's what my focus is. That's what affects commodities. That, that's what I. That's where my my analysis comes from. I I'm not making any statement about social policies and other things, the environment. I'm simply talking about the finances and the economics of the United States government only. Um. So everyone out there, don't get too excited. Was, this is an economic discussion. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's keep it that way. But my point is, does it really matter who wins? From that perspective only, I don't think it does matter. Both uh, candidates are proposing more spending and are not proposing uh, any way to support that. We already are running the massive, massive fiscal deficits. Um, our interest expense is soaring now. The interest expense is large; is the second largest cost item in our budget. It's higher than the defense budget, and it's higher than Medicare Medicaid budget. It's and, and it's growing every single month. I don't see any candidate with a plan to solve that. Meaning, four years from now, we're going to have that spiraling further out of control. I don't see either administration providing any hope that they're going to do anything about getting realistic about the finances of the government. So from that perspective, I don't think it really matters. Now, how they get to that point is obviously a little different, but does it really matter in the end that if we're going to be moving towards a debt crisis within four years from either administration, does it really matter who gets in from that perspective only? I don't think actually it does. Um, yes, there are different policies with Trump and tariffs and, you know, Harris and other policies that are, you know, uh, Green New Deal. You know, there's there's different ways that they get there. But my point is, in fact, it, it, people should be uh, – Stan Druckenmiller, one of, the, one of the legendary money managers of all time, did a interview this week talking about this um, scenario. Um, Paul Tudor Jones, one of the most one of the most legendary commodity traders in the history of commodities, did an interview this week discussing this exact point. I would very much encourage anyone who has an interest in talking about why it doesn't really matter who gets in from this perspective. Should listen to what these some of the smartest financial minds in the world coming to a conclusion that we were heading towards a debt crisis, and 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 the reality is we have two choices that are incapable. Of from their policies of solving it, really would, I would encourage everyone to, to listen to those interviews. It was really, really uh, very, very good. 
and um, and very much something I've been advocating for a long time that it doesn't really matter from that perspective. Um, and what it also means, it means that inflation is the solution. The government doesn't want to stop inflation. The only way that it can continue to spend and continue to manage debt of this magnitude is to continue to inflate. So as much as everyone is saying, oh, we got to slow inflation. No, they don't. They, want, they can't slow inflation. They want to keep it going. Yeah. Um, they want it high enough to keep, keep themselves out of trouble, but not so high that they get pushback from the voters. And that's the, that's the game that we're here playing. Yep. Um, so having said that, having said that, if I could share my screen, Casey. Sure, go ahead. Um, let's um, first look at what I'm going to look at here. Yeah. So this is uh, the Iowa electronic markets. You could lose a lot. There's a lot of betting markets, but this is the black line is Harris and the yellow line or orange line is Trump. And you can see what's been happening that Trump has been um, gaining and Harris has been weakening. And it's, it's, it's a statistical dead heat right now, Casey. Um, now, you know, now a lot of people think that, uh, you know, are, are betting that Trump is ne- is going to, to win. Um, we will see my, uh, view with all of this, Casey, is that, um, whoever speaks last will lose the election. Meaning both, both yeah. candidates are so atrocious yeah. in my opinion, yeah. I'm just speaking about their ability to speak yep. both par- both. Candidates are so atrocious when they get up and speak. Every time Trump says something, he he loses in the in in the in the betting polls. Every time Harris speaks, she loses in the polls. So she had this town hall meeting, you know, and immediately she just dropped in the polls because yeah. she sounded so bad. But but Trump is capable of saying anything at any time, and 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 the same thing is. So my view yeah. is, whoever shuts up will win. Yep. Uh, and, Right there with you. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and, and, and this is not one or the other. I'm, I'm not playing sides. I'm just that's where we're at, and, yep. and, and it could come down. Tr- somebody could something could happen the day before the elections could could sway it one way or the other. Yep. I don't think anybody can predict this thing right now, Casey. As much as right now the markets are betting on Trump, I, I don't. He's so volatile. Anything's possible. And the other thing you have to remember is that world leaders might view the last. Few, few days but as an opportunity to do something spectacular on the international geopolitical front um so we need to be open to some wild potential external um forces that may impact our markets and may impact the elections as well that have nothing to do with what trump is saying or what harris is saying um so we have to keep that in mind and i want to i want to i want to share my screen one more time casey because i think i think this is far more important than who wins the election, which I don't think actually, in fact, matters from an economic point of view. This is the Congress. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down this way. This line here, Casey, can you see this? The blue one, yep. Yeah. That's it, uh, the Republicans sweeping the House and the Senate. You know, it, it's about a 25% chance based on the betting markets right now. Mm-hmm. What the market's betting on with almost a 60% chance is that we're going to have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate. Um, what what this actually is saying, there's an 85% chance that the Senate is Republican. Um, so so, so it, this says that we're likely to have a divided Congress. You can't trust either side any time that we've had the House and the Senate on one side or the other has been a disaster policy-wise for the country, in my personal opinion. So the fact that we are likely to have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate is probably the best news from my perspective. The, you know, the way this works is the House sets the policy agenda, and the Senate decides how, what part of that policy agenda they're going to actually go with. Right, and it means that probably no matter who gets in, Harris or Trump, there's a, a, a massive limit to what they're going to be able to push. Some of the most ridiculous policies that both sides are promoting, which are stupid, they're not going to get through a divided Congress. 
I think that's the most optimistic thing that I could come away with, Casey, is that if we do get a Democratic House or Republican Senate, I'm, I'm very confident that's going to keep some of the ridiculous policies that both sides are promoting, no matter who gets in at bay. And I and I think that's going to 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 um to um uh, sort of dilute some of these more extreme policies. And to the extent, by the way, that doesn't save us from a debt crisis, but at least it saves us from 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 exacerbating it to the degree that some of these ridiculous policies that both candidates are suggesting right now to try to buy votes are going to be doing. So So that, to me, is the most optimistic thing that I see from the election, is that the Congress is going to be split, and it's going to keep I, either candidate, whoever gets in, uh, from doing anything too extreme or, or too caustic at this point. Um, and, and in terms of commodities, um, and I said, this, I said this last time, and some people didn't like what I said, and that's fine. But this is a discussion about commodities and markets and economics, not about anything other than that. But from the perspective of simply what would be more bullish for commodities, I do believe that a Harris administration would be more bullish for higher commodity prices in aggregate, uh, whereas I believe uh, uh, Trump's um, distortive uh tariff trade war policies at least in the first couple of years i think would be more detrimental to commodities in terms of you know they, they would have a more of a, a headwind to commodities that doesn't mean commodities cannot go up during trump right. like if we have the weather scenario i just talked about they're going to go up no matter who's in office it's right. a question of degree how much do they go up how much are there are there fanning of inflation? You know, and I and I just feel that if you're if you're asking about the impact to commodities only, Vice President Harris winning the presidency would provide a greater tailwind to the upside, in my opinion, than Trump than a Trump victory at this point. Um, on the margin, from the weather that we've just discussed with winter wheat, with Brazil. And with a dry fall probably leading into a, a, a more drought-ridden, potentially severe drought-ridden summer growing season for the U.S., that is going to that that scenario is is a is a tailwind that would override um, even negative um, administrative headwinds if the weather is bad. Weather overrides all things if bad enough. So. So, so my view is I stay focused on the weather because that's what I have an edge in. That's what I believe I have a good lead on. That's I believe it's going to be significant enough to override those things. And 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 I and I try to stay away from as much as I can about predicting timing of geopolitics and all sorts of things because as we've learned, it can be very hard to predict which chess piece moves first, second, and third, and the impacts. But if you get the weather right, you're going to get directionally the, the ag markets right. And the way I am seeing things, the way the weather is playing out. I do believe that we are looking at a overall trend uh, higher in ag markets, especially grain markets, going into next summer. Um, geopolitics and elections notwithstanding. Okay. I mean, I think what you're talking about just shows how tight this thing is. There's not going to be a walk away winner uh, in any of these races, to be as far as I can tell. I mean. In some areas, you're going to see some some huge victories, but I mean, um, you, you start looking at where the polls are at and what, and you know, pretty much throw polls out the window. But I mean, just the sentiment that you feel because the the heat that you catch on on one side versus the other is is pretty even. So <laughs> that just tells me, like, you know, I mean, it's uh, you you this this thing's going to be drug out and it's going to be. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely three or four weeks before you know he's president. Everyone thinks States. that this is gonna, we're gonna we're gonna have yeah. our answer on uh, uh, you know the following morning, and, and I think we're gonna be stuck in indecision for 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 weeks, yeah, or, or even a month later before you know we can really you know settle the score. But as I said last time, and I will say again, history says whoever is the is shown to be the victor the next morning on the initial tally, it's very very hard. To overcome that, typically yeah. historically. So, in the end of the day, if you whoever appears to have, no matter how tight, no matter how narrow the margin, whichever side appears to be the or is deemed to be the victor the next morning, 
as much as there might be a, a lot of uh, lawsuits, and, da, 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 and most likely they will prevail in the end. So just keep that in mind. Yep. Another thing I read too is whoever's leading um, the morning of the election typically is also. Um, well, we, 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 we have to remember. I, I, I don't. I don't know exactly the numbers, but I, I think over half the people now vote early. Like, oh yeah, I wouldn't vote early because you know we're during my uh, Moon Iron Summit is fourth, fifth, and sixth, right? So it's right Tuesday, right, right in the middle of it. And I, so I was like, oh, let's run down and vote real quick. Who's going to be? I waited in line for almost thirty minutes in my little town of Scottsbluff, Nebraska. You know, so well, I mean, but because of early voting now, where it's not everyone has yeah. to wait for Tuesday. I mean, I mean the election. I wouldn't say it's all. It's it's almost decided. It's probably almost decided already. You know, before we even get to Tuesday, yeah. because so many people already voted, and and and, and yeah, but we may not know exactly how, how everybody voted, but remember that that you know everybody votes so early now that it's just interesting that it used to be everyone voted on that one day, and and we, but yeah. now it's it's really there's a lot of people that try to extract who's you know as you said who's who's leading in the early yeah. voting um you know going into that and you know we'll have to pay attention to what that looks like on uh, on election day but i do think that the, the moment whoever has that momentum probably carries it through probably yep, yep. and this year I, I mean just it was bad um Polarization was bad in, in, in 2016 and going through 2020, um, and it was got worse 2020 through where we're at today, and it's going it's worse than it was then. So, I, I am. Um, my advice. Yeah, God dang, just stay home. My <laughs> advice. My advice to Vice President Harris. Mm -hmm. Don't say anything else. Just, just let everyone else speak for you. And for Trump, I would advise him to stop talking. And let everyone yeah. speak for him. I think yeah. I think both candidates would be served to say nothing the rest of the way because it only hurt if, if if they're only focused on winning the election, they hurt themselves by speaking. And the more they speak, historically we've been seeing it time and time again, the more each yeah. candidate speaks, the worse they are in the polls. And I just think that that is sadly where we're at. Yeah. That's uh weird time, Sean, for it's, sure. It is it is the most insane time I have seen uh, to have this um, situation where we have uh, a, a choice between uh, such administrations and such personalities at this point. But that is that is where we're at, and uh, uh, and we have to um, you know live hand in hand and heart to heart and 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 uh, upward and onward from here. So. That's right. That's right. All right, Sean. Well, we will catch you again next week, and uh, we will go from there. Sean, have a good rest of yours, and uh, folks want to reach out to you. What's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, -T, advisors.com. We also have a Twitter page, at Faradex11. Also have a LinkedIn page. From time to time, we put some information on there, interviews that talk about our cycle statistics and correlations and how we use that to make price forecasts in agriculture. Right on. Sean, appreciate you being on. We'll catch you again next time. Sounds good, Casey. Always a blast. Right on. In case you see more Moving Iron Podcast, check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, X, I keep saying uh, Twitter. <laughs> X, hit, hit me up over there, uh, at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn, the Moving Iron Podcast. Check out the video version of this over on the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And you can also go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour. We're Sean Hackett. Let's move some iron, folks. Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. Find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships.
Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment, but nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Woo!